I'm here with George Milton, who is the founder of Yellowbird Foods. And uh, George, thank you so much for taking the time out and hanging out with us. Thanks for having me, man. I got nothing but free time. Let's do it. <laughs> I happen to know that, that that's not true. Uh, I also, I didn't know, and I, I'm probably about to get fired. I didn't know how big a deal Yellowbird was until like people were like, oh my goodness, you run ads for Yellowbird, like that, but that's my favorite salsa. So y'all have like a nice, solid footprint in your industry. You kind of own that space a bit. Yeah, we should, we kind of pride ourselves on on doing the thing that we do really well. Uh, I think we got recognition for that uh, pretty much across the U.S. right now. I mean, not everybody knows uh, what our brand is, but we're working on changing that. So, yeah. Yeah. And your fans are ravenous, no pun intended. Yeah. Um, so that's a good place to be. Do you mind giving us just a little bit of background on like how you got started? Where, where, where this all began? Yeah, so I'll tell you as short a version as I can. Um, me and my partner, co-founder, uh, Aaron, actually, this this started as a passion project. We we both really like spicy food. Uh, we were both uh, we were both athletes in school and stuff. I'll connect these two in a second. But uh, the 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 point was we we were both in our late twenties, um, kind of getting into that part of our lives where we we're like, hey, we want to we want to like still be fit people, but you know, we, so cleaning up our diet was a big part of that. Um, anybody who's listening to this, who has crossed over from your twenties to thirties understands that diet, diet becomes more important. You can't just, you know, eat anything you want and be bulletproof. So we got into this mindset of really like reading labels, really like researching ingredients and like, what are these preservatives and what are the, you know, I get, I get really nerdy about like what lab studies have been done about potassium sorbate or whatever. Right. Like, and, and that's something that's in a lot of sauces it's in a lot of like hummus products things like that that you want to like, maintain like the color and kind of like quote unquote freshness for three five years whatever mm. um and so we got we were getting really diligent about that in you know 2012 and uh i we had basically cleaned up our diet cleaned up a bunch of like added sugars preservatives you know natural flavorings you know things that are not really real food uh, the only thing I was having trouble with was like the types of like hot sauce and chili sauce that I like to use and condiments to cook with and use it, you know, use as condiments. And so this was something that I just started making in our kitchen um, for, for the two of us here in Austin, Texas. And uh, that was, you know, eight, nine years ago. Uh, and it was really one of those things that started like, hey, let's, uh, Aaron is a graphic designer. Um, and I kind of, I uh, grew up in the uh, working in restaurants, things like that. So this is kind of like a collaborative project for the two of us. And we just basically started taking it around to local places here in Austin, like local restaurants, farmers markets, things like that. That's how it started. And people just, it, we found out that there were a lot of people who had that same uh, kind of itch that we had. It was like, hey, let's, we're cause we were making, we were like, hey, let's make these chili sauces just using like fresh produce and stuff you know, not a bunch of like water and xanthan gum and, you know, sugar and fillers and whatever, but like, uh, let's just make a really, really great product. And the, you know, people have continued to respond to it. I mean, we use a bunch of, fr we use fresh ingredients, we use real food. So that's kind of how we got started. We, um, the, the very, our, the very first iteration of where we were selling our products was the local farmers markets, restaurants, and then um, online, you know, we, we started our e-com shop in 2013. And I mean, at that point it was just like PayPal, we were just getting orders through PayPal and mm -hmm. we get somebody's address. And then we'd have to like take that address and go make a label. And, you know, like it was all very, very manual. And we didn't do, I mean, for a very long time, we didn't really do much advertising, um, outside of just like, Hey, we have social media or we'd get, some really cool articles like in the early days there there were some articles from like thrillist that was like you know in 2013 thrillist was like yellowbird sauce the next big thing and meanwhile it's just me like with a you know so with a, cool. like a five gallon <laughs> pot i'm like is it the next big thing holy crap okay um so that's kind of how we started that's the that's the short version but we we uh we're uh one of the now at this point one of the uh best uh fastest growing national uh natural hot sauce brands in the u.s and we're killing it on amazon killing it on uh on the e-com and 
Yeah. What else? What did I miss? Well, no, man, that's amazing. So most of the people watching this, I think, are going to be trying to get into the e-com game. Yeah. And the thing that I love the most usually when I'm exposed to content like this is I like to hear about people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. I want to know, like, if you could go back or talk to a younger you or, you know, do things a little bit differently, like, what are the things that you'd advise, uh, uh, you know, the, the early stage e-commerce entrepreneur against? Like, what can we warn them off of? Well, this doesn't 100% answer your question, but I honestly wish we had invested more in e-commerce earlier on. We went more like brick and mortar retail was kind of like, we started with e-commerce and local, and then we got a bunch of opportunity in brick and mortar retail. Um, so I think e com is the great, you know, if you're watching this and you're getting into e com I think that's a really great place to prove out uh, a business. You know, like mistakes, mistakes that I've made just in general in business is over investing in something before it's proven out. So there, there's always, I, no matter how big a business gets, I think like my, my point of view is that you should prove out something before you invest all of your money in, into it. So Dude, you know, I think that that's what we do. Say what? I said, it's such a value bomb. Cause I feel like we all did that, you know, early stage entrepreneurs, you spend so much time building the thing before you even see if anybody wants it. That's yeah. huge. So like we, and we tried to do that with new, um, new product launches and things like that. But like that was every time that I over invested in something and said, this is going to be a big thing and invested a lot of time, a lot of money or whatever in it. Every time that I've done that without having the intermediate steps of like, let's try it with this audience. Let's ramp it up a little bit. Every time that I, that I've done this instead of this, it's been a mistake. So mm -hmm. Um, I, I would, I would always like urge, you know, and I always try to urge like people who are just starting businesses to, to like, whether you have outside funding or you've got a trust fund or however much money you're starting with to resist the urge to, to say, this is the next big thing. Like let people tell you that it's the next big thing. Yeah. Let the market um, guide. Yeah. Let the market do like, cause you can do, I mean, market research is great. But like people, people will ask us, how do we, how do we do market research? And we were like, we just try stuff. And we see like the cool thing about e-commerce is that you can do it as incrementally as you want to. And you know this, right? Like if we have a campaign or a new product or something, like if I've got an idea for a new product, I can make a hundred of them, you know, it does, I don't have to release, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it would be like, okay, well, I got to. I'm working with Walmart. So if I'm going to try a new product, I have to release a you know, hundred thousand of them to all these stores, but you don't have to do it. Like you can be so incremental now and, and be bigger than a farmer's market brand. Like I can launch something on, you know, I can launch a new thing on, on e-commerce and try it out pretty fast. Right. Dude, what a brilliant model. So you would use e-com in order to prove initial early stage concept and then go like, if you're in well, Walmart or Trader Joe's or whatever, now you can push it out in mass uh with you know the, the the proof of concept having already been done yeah you can i mean you can you can figure out your uh because i think for us like the interesting thing is always we think that this is going to be perceived we think that some product or some uh campaign or whatever is going to pr be perceived in one way or get, get engagement from one set of people and it doesn't right it, it performs differently than we thought it was going yeah. to and because we have our own biases and we're like, oh, well, this, this video ad or whatever is like a comedy ad. We think it's going to work for these people and it works for a whole other set of people. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it is certainly helpful to make assumptions, but I think that like one of the powers of, of like D to C and e-com is that you can test those like in real time with real people who are willing to pay money for your products. I mean, obviously like there has to be some, you know, and probably what you're uh, what you guys are talking about is there there has to be you have to have a valuable product right it, it has you have to have like you know no matter what business you're in you have to have like a unique value proposition you know so like if if i had if i skipped over that i'm assuming that people know that you have to have a unique value proposition and that can be 
it can be anything that's valuable to people, but you have to know what it is. You know, it's like our value proposition is not we're the cheapest hot sauce, right? Mm -hmm. So we never talk, we never say, hey, value pack pricing, you know, that's, we don't lead with that because that's not our proposition, right? Like, so like anything that you're doing, if you're buying stuff and reselling it, there's got to be some, you know, it, what, we make we make a product. So like, we're, we're not reselling a product, we're making a product. So our value proposition is we make this with the best ingredients, highest quality standards. Like it's the best version of this that you can get. If, you know, like we get prices, we get price questions all the time and we answer, you know, we answer them, right? We don't avoid price questions, but that's not our value proposition. If somebody, if somebody comes to us and says, and says, but this uh, hot sauce, like I want something as cheap as this other brand. We're like, that's not what we do Buy the other brand. Like that's, if that's, if that's what your value is, that's not what our number one value is. So it's like, it's like being in a relationship with somebody. If you're like, this is my number one priority. And somebody else is like, well, my number one priority is something totally different. And you're like, okay, peace. We shouldn't be in a relationship. With yeah. You. We yeah. shouldn't be in a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, 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 I don't want what you want. So like, I think that that's where to start is like, if you don't know that from day one, you should sort of figure that out. Like if you're, if you're like a reseller, what is your, what is your position? Do you like, you know, cause we see, we see a lot of, uh, we do a lot of Amazon resellers and stuff. And so th that can be a profitable model, but even if you're an Amazon reseller, you have to have like a position, like we have the lowest cost model, you know, get it from, uh, get it from us as a reseller um, at the lowest cost. We, we're always going to have the, the lowest cost of, whatever items we sell, or we provide the best service, mm. you know, and our goal would be, you know, if I, if I'm, a, if I'm a third party Amazon seller, and my goal is to provide the best service, then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pay what it costs to provide the best service and then pass that on to my customers. And then my goal is to get seller rankings is to maximize my seller rankings, as opposed to like maximizing my buy box acquisition so like there i mean that's amazon is a tough market as as a as a third-party reseller i know that's not really what we're talking about but it's no it's aligned for sure and you know there's some consistency with everybody that we're interviewing right now and i honestly just it just kind of occurred to me as we were speaking they all have a very real passion for their product and it, it maybe even started that way and a lot of our students and hopefully nobody takes umbrage with this statement a lot of our students just want to get into e-com and it's like one of the questions we get sometimes is like, oh, what product should I sell? And part of me is like, man, you shouldn't be asking me that. Like, I'm, you come to me after you have figured that out. But, you know, we get, we get some folks that come to us and they're like drop shipping cell phone cases and there's no margin there, you know, there's no value proposition, like you said, and it, it just ends up being, it ends up being tough. So it's almost like, hey, go figure out what you're passionate about first. And like you said, where you can provide that additional layer of value. Um, even if you're a reseller, there's other stuff you can do. And I think your point about customer service is a brilliant one. Because it's a race to the bottom from a price perspective if you're reselling somebody else's product until you layer on value that other people aren't laying on. And, and now all of a sudden you kind of have your own, your, your own unique selling proposition. So I think that's a value bomb too. That's a couple of like really awesome nuggets, George. Thank you. Uh, I mean, these are all mistakes that we've made and learned from. But yeah, I think that that's, I think it's important. I think that like, you can certainly say like, start a, I, I'm just going to drop ship cell phone cases business but there still has to be like a value problem. Why does somebody buy my cell phone cases? And maybe there's, maybe it's just like, Hey, nobody else is reselling this. I found a, you know, manufacturer in China or something who does these, you know, really bomb proof cases. And mm -hmm. I'm the only one I, you know, I worked out an importing deal with them and I can get them in and I'm the only one selling them and they're pretty cheap and they're pretty durable. And that's like, that's a value proposition, but like, it's not just like what product you're selling, but why, like, why are you selling? Why would I buy this product from you for this price or whatever? Yeah. I've got a buddy who sells memory cards, which is a total commoditized waste to the bottom. Like everybody sells them for, you know, pennies above markup. And all he did is he went out and he found this company that does uh, 24 seven customer support. And if you have questions about the memory card, you can call them and they'll answer the questions. And it, he carved out a whole niche for himself because there's people that are worried about, you know, what they can put on it, what the storage is, how to, whatever. And nobody else in the memory card space is willing to do that. 
And so to your point, like he added a value proposition in an industry where you didn't think there was one. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, I mean, I think there's always like a layer of value that you can, that you can add. So yeah. you get really creative with your marketing. Like your videos are awesome. Uh, and well, I, I, so t talk to me just a little bit about that. I feel like you try a lot of different things. Uh, has that served you? Where does it come from? And, and where have you been most successful from a marketing perspective? Um, uh, those are big questions, but I, I think that like, uh, oh man, I, one, one of the books I'm actually like propping up my, uh, uh, <laughs> propping up my uh, microphone with. Iterate. But I think like we, we talk about this idea of like iterating, of, of like trying, and we've talked about this with the, with John with Soul Eight and stuff like that is that we want to try stuff, right? Like hmm. we're, you know, we're bigger than a startup, right? We're, you know, we'd be considered considered like a emerging brand. Like we're still got a lot of growth trajectory, stuff like that, but we're not a startup anymore. Um, but even so, like this, this idea that I kind of mentioned already about like trying things, like we're, we're like, we do a, we do a, a podcast uh our, like our brand does a does a podcast and it's uh it's got nothing to do with hot sauce really like people call in we have a hotline people call in um 855-700 bird if you guys want to call it it's but it's just it's just a for like it's a fun it's like ask us any question and we will answer it <laughs> on our on our podcast and so people ask us people ask us all sorts of things and that's it has it has nothing to do with hot sauce, but it's all about like trying, it's just trying something that's fairly, like it's it's fairly low, like we, we don't need a lot of inputs. I mean, we've got four people on the podcast, we've all got microphones and video cameras and that's it, right? Like we pay for some hosting for, you know, but you know, the whole thing costs us like $20 a month just to try it. And we've got, um, you know, like we've got a coupon code that, that we kind of bury in there like hey if you listen to this podcast you get this discount on our website We're, the podcast isn't about hot sauce but that's like our second most redeemed coupon code no way it's from that podcast so it's just like getting trying things to and we might not do the podcast forever but you, know, you talked about the videos and like my background is like i have a my uh, my undergraduate degrees are in music and theater so i mean i got my stuff here behind me but like that's what i did was like like i was a performer for a lot of years before i was a business person so like i'm trying to figure out we've talked about this i've seen your uh, i've seen some of your film work yeah but nobody else has george so yeah all right don't, yeah <laughs> yeah don't look it up you probably cut this part out but uh probably <laughs> you know i like like i like i'm trying to say like hey like we're always trying to say like hey not just with our product but like with our company that like there's a you, there's another layer that other people don't have right like there's a lot of people running hot sauce companies that aren't you know that aren't performers with you know bachelor of arts and like experience like doing this out in the real world so it's like okay if we can add something there if we can you add we did a, around it you can build yeah and it's it's a i mean again it's like a unique it's a unique value proposition because we're not we're not just you know we're not just hot sauce it's not just this or that or the other because you know as soon as other hot sauce brands figure out like oh fresh ingredients no preservatives then then what right then we still have to like maintain something unique so mm -hmm. like part of it is uh it's just trying to like iterate on different things and see if like hey it's 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 pretty low risk you know if we're not trying something insanely offensive which is not really our brand right like there's brands out there like I don't know, like bird dogs is a great example of an e-com brand where like their brand is, is somewhat offensive and like bro-ish and stuff like that, but it really works for them. That's not really our brand. So like we can't, because we're not really doing stuff that's ridiculously offensive, we can just try stuff and let people say, again, just like products, we can let people tell us, you know, and, and this is, you know, when we're looking at, uh, because we're using uh, Soul 8 to help us serve some of those uh, uh, some of those video ads on YouTube. And so like, just looking at it every week, like we can tell, Hey, you know, people are clicking through it, but they're not buying. So like, this is a video that I can relegate to like, Hey, if I want clicks, 
let's use this, you know, mm. like if I'm not, if, but we've got other stuff that gets lower clicks, but we get more value from like a, like customer acquisition. We get more purchase from stuff that's more product related. So it's just like, if we didn't try that out, if we didn't spend a little money, like, you know, a little money and time, like making those videos and then like spend a little bit of money, like advertising them and like looking at how they return, then we would just wonder, right? We would just wonder like, is this a good, is this a good ad campaign? So like, I, I don't know if I would like, I mean, we don't have the, the kind of money to do like a Super Bowl commercial, but like if I was going to do a Super Bowl, Super Bowl commercial, I would just be, you know, I would be nervous that we hadn't tried out enough stuff to know what kind of, um, like what kind of video advertising does well for, you know, for that kind of like super, super top of funnel advertising. Yeah, what a brilliant point before you run your Super Bowl commercial or whatever is analogous to that, make sure that it qualifies on YouTube. Or, or wherever, you know, like right. Facebook, Instagram, wherever you can try it out. Uh, George, I really appreciate your time. I know we're coming up to the end of it. Any closing words or advice for new e-com store owners? Uh, yeah, I mean, don't, yeah, value proposition and don't be afraid to try stuff. That's it. That's awesome. Where can they uh, find your podcast? Uh, it's on, it's everywhere, uh, everywhere podcasts are delivered. Uh, I usually, I usually, uh, listen on Spotify or Stitcher, but it's called the uh, yellow bird hotline podcast. Okay. I'll link to it in the description of this video. Yeah. I really appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much. Thanks man. It was super valuable.